This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. There might be a silver lining to the pandemic if you're a bicyclist. Coming up, we'll talk to bike advocate Karen Jenkins about how cities can use this moment to shift away from our car-centric habits and focus on bike infrastructure. What's bike infrastructure? We'll explain. First, how many of you relied on public transit like trains and buses to get to work? Ridership is way down on Metro North, but we also talk about rail and busways that run in other portions of Connecticut. If the way we work and commute is forever altered by the pandemic, what should officials focus on in the months and years ahead? We'll talk about that with my guest today, and we want to hear from you. You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. You can also share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. I want to welcome on Zoom today, Jim Cameron, commuter advocate and author of Getting There. It's a weekly commentary on transportation. It runs in Hearst newspapers and on ctmirror.org. Jim, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Lucy. Also here with us is Rich Andreski, Bureau Chief for Public Transportation at the Connecticut Department of Transportation. Rich, welcome to where we live. Thank you for having me, Lucy. Good morning. So we couldn't have predicted the weather uh, this morning on a show where we're talking about uh, transportation, uh, but I'm glad that both of you were able to join us uh, despite the snow uh, on Zoom, thankfully. Rich, uh, take us back to March uh, when when we were all first uh, dealing with what this pandemic would mean uh, for our lives. Did you and others at the Connecticut DOT really have a sense of how much this virus would disrupt public transit? You know, back then there was a lot of talk more about hand sanitizer and how to disinfect seats, so to speak. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I mean, looking back, it's um, I don't know that anyone really had a sense of how this was going to overtake everyday life in the way that it has. Uh, yeah, I do recall in the early days we were focused on on high touch surfaces. And remember, masks weren't a thing at that time. Um, So yeah, we've come a long way uh, in understanding the virus and understanding how best to combat and keep uh, keep people safe on public transportation. Mm. So remind us, take us on a a brief tour, uh, Rich, of Connecticut's mass transit services. A lot of a focus, obviously, on on Metro North when we're going uh, with the commuters down in the Fairfield County area. But thinking about, you know, CT Rail, uh, also our uh, bus uh, transit system, and how many people are served? So every day, uh, you know, in Connecticut, before the pandemic, we served about 300,000 commuters every day. I say commuters, uh, they're really transit transit riders. Uh, some of them are going to work. Others are t- for uh, medical appointments or to, you know, reach uh, educational opportunity. Uh, we've seen those numbers plummet, though, with COVID. Uh, we're down 85% on rail, uh, down to a lesser extent on bus, uh, down only about uh, 35 to 40% on bus. Um, and that uh, th- that's an interesting story in and of itself in that the folks who ride trains are, are typically those folks that are commuting to major cities, uh, tend to hold jobs that can be done remotely. Um, and that's not the case with our, our bus riders. Many are service sector uh, folks that are providing a service. They have to be present. So uh, it's it's pretty critical that we keep those buses and trains moving through the pandemic. Before we talk more about Metro North, tell us more about CT Transit. So looking at Shoreline East, the Hartford line, uh, you said that there have been drops, but not as severely as Metro North. So tell us more about who are the people riding today? So uh, the the Metro North services, uh, the the New Haven line, many folks know, um, and and of course, our other rail lines, um, were primarily serving commuters um, before COVID. Uh, that's changed uh, significantly. Um, most of the New York ridership has disappeared, all but disappeared. And what we're seeing is uh, the riders that we've retained are those riders riding more locally, say from New Haven to Stamford. Um, we've seen strong ridership, uh, believe it or not, on some of our branch lines, uh, Waterbury Line service, uh, although it's, it's uh, many fewer trains per day. Um, we're, we're seeing some of the greatest retention of riders on that service. And that tells us a story that, uh, again, you know, the, these are individuals um, who um, what we know is that uh, they don't have an alternative. Um, you know, many folks we've heard um, across the country and may be running out to lease a car or find another way to get to work. Not everyone has that option. So it's it's been it's been critical. We've we've been fortunate, I would say, uh, because we've received federal aid 
that we've been able to keep those trains running um, and those bus, buses running, but uh, that, that federal aid will run out at some point. Now, you mentioned bus ridership has only dropped about 35 percent. And so when we think about the people riding buses, uh, whether it's in Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, many of these are essential workers trying to get to their jobs. They are service sector, right? We, we, we first and foremost think of essential workers in the, in the medical care uh, arena. But uh, essential workers also stock our grocery shelves, also provide critical um, at-home medical care for individuals. Uh, we have uh, individuals that rely on pu- public para- public transportation power transit service who uh, go take transit to reach dialysis appointments. So these are literally uh, uh, these uh, bus drivers and and train conductors are literally providing uh, an absolutely critical and essential service to these uh, riders that depend on it. Mm. Jim Cameron, you're you live in down in the Fairfield County area. Tell us about the disruptions you're seeing. Well, uh, you know, as Rich pointed out, Metro North is primarily focused on moving or was moving people in and out of New York City. Uh, And, you know, the whole economy of Fairfield County has been dependent on that service, its reliability, its accessibility. People who were working in the city wanted to have a good quality of life uh, and be able to get to and from their jobs quickly. So uh, when the pandemic hit, it absolutely shut things down. I mean, ridership was down 90% in uh, the worst days of the pandemic. And it's only slowly coming back. And I'm most concerned with what's going to happen in the future after we get a vaccination, because I don't think that ridership is going to come back to anywhere near the old levels. Mm, And that is the question. Rich Andreski, how is uh, Connecticut DOT thinking about this? Yeah, we we get we get questions uh, all the time about uh, the future of public transportation, and I will I will tell you this that um, I, you know I I was working um, you know through uh, the ni- the nine eleven event uh, working in New Jersey at the time, and there was a lot of speculation about the future of transit, the future of cities, and I can tell you that uh, first and foremost, I think uh, you know cities are very resilient places. Uh, New York is a is a global city. Um, we may not see a return to normal as in what we understood prior prior to COVID, but um, uh, we we also believe that uh, riders will return in, in some way. What may happen is individuals may no longer be making a trip five days per week. Um, we we think there will be a blend of telework and uh, in person work. Um, and then, of course, there's other reasons you travel, right? It's, it's commutation is, is what we generally think of first. But um, our off-peak ridership for many years has been growing. And our reverse, what we call reverse peak, the, the travelers in New York coming up to Stanford, um, that market was growing as well. So, uh, you know, we think there's still opportunity. And, and then I'll say one more thing, which is a, a shift in emphasis. For so many years, we struggled to provide the seats and the capacity we needed in the peak period and having a, a, f- a fewer, slightly fewer riders or many fewer riders in the peak period opens up opportunity, opportunity to provide different types of services where we simply didn't have the, the train capacity to do it before. But the real question is, how are we going to keep paying for this railroad mm-hmm. if ridership does drop off? Even when the railroad was standing room only, Every train trip lost money, and the deficit was made up out of the special transportation fund. If ridership does not come back, that deficit is going to balloon at the same time that the legislature is reluctant to do anything to get the special transportation fund out of the red, where it's expected to go sometime in the middle of this year. So we are literally in a perfect storm. Ridership Mm -hmm. down, the legislature AWOL, and the Special Transportation Fund, which helps subsidize mass transit and repair our roads and bridges, is in jeopardy. Mm. And Jim, we'll be talking more about the the resources that are needed uh, to keep uh, mass transit going. Uh, So much focus on our railways and running railroads is very expensive. And when we think about uh, what 
uh, Rich just shared about uh, how our work weeks, especially for people commuting uh, to and from New York, uh, will look very different. It's a good question. Where is the money going to come from in terms of uh, paying for this service? Uh, I wanted to just reset and let our, our listeners know who we're talking with today. Jim Cameron, commuter advocate and author of Getting There. It's a weekly commentary on transportation, which runs in Hearst newspapers and on ctmirror.org. Also with us, Rich Andreski, Bureau Chief for Public Transportation at the Connecticut Department of Transportation. You can join us too, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Miriam's calling in for New Haven. Miriam, what's your question? Okay. Um, I think I've spoken to Mr. Andreski before, but my issue is in CT Transit buses, they have, they, have a, they have a policy to not enforce the mask mandate. So if a passenger decides to not wear a mask or take it down, some drivers will mention it. Many others won't. They don't have to. The, dri- the passengers are allowed to stay on the bus. They're not, they're not told they have to leave or put on a mask. There's no masks on the mat bracks anymore. That was done for a little short while, but I have not. Most buses I've gone now have no masks. I've seen people lower their masks to eat, drink, talk. I saw a guy spit the other day, you know, lowering his mask. And, not, and pe- there are people who feel that they're high risk, you know, for COVID complications. They feel they can no longer ride the bus, even if they have no alternative transportation options. And there are other people who just have to get to their jobs or wherever and just have no choice and have to live with it. And what, how do you feel about this? Like Metro North has an enforcement policy. New York City Transit buses and subways have an enforcement policy, but CT Transit doesn't. Uh, Rich, how do you respond to Miriam's uh, question? I know she's also called in when Governor Lamont's been on the show. Yeah, it's a great question, um, and I understand uh, the concern. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we we do have a policy of enforcing mask wearing, but that inf- enforcement uh, begins and ends with the the bus driver um, uh, providing specific direction to the customer to wear a mask. If the customer refuses to wear a mask. There's um, there's a, a couple courses of action that are available to that bus driver. Uh, one is to uh, keep the bus at the side of the road and uh, request the dispatch or contact police for assistance. Um, what we have tended to do is we have tried to uh, encourage the bus drivers to isolate the individual to the greatest extent possible, um, offer the mask. The bus drivers do have additional masks that they have, um, but in the end, um, there is there is risk in delaying travelers and waiting for police assistance. That in itself is an additional risk, uh, additional wait time with that individual on board the bus without the mask. And then, of course, the potential for escalation. Um, we, we do not want to escalate situations. Again, we're carrying um, uh, tens of thousands of riders a day. Um, and um, it's, it's just it is a balancing act. Uh, unfortunately, um, some individuals uh, do refuse. Now, when we do surveys and we look at compliance, we do see high compliance. Um, there are exceptions, but we're seeing about 90 percent of our riders wearing the mask. Mm. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, we know that COVID spreads easily in, in closed spaces. And so that is, it sounds problematic if someone's on a bus, Rich, and, and people aren't uh, wearing their masks properly or not wearing them at all. I ask, have there been outbreaks linked to CT Transit buses or trains? You know, it's it's a very difficult thing to, to uh, prove conclusively because what we know right now is COVID is spreading at a community level. Um, it's it's present uh, in our families and neighborhoods and, and uh, shopping centers. And so w- when someone does get diagnosed with COVID, it's, it's, it is tough to conclusively say w- how, how they contracted it. Now, in some cases, it's possible. Uh, we are um, working very closely with national um, thought leaders on how best to treat for COVID. Uh, we've even reached out to Yale, uh, Yale University, and they've been fantastic partners in studying um, some ways to improve, um, you know, outcomes on public transportation. And what we know is this: the air quality on our public transportation system is is very good. Um, uh, the air exchange rates on our rail cars and buses is frequent, and we know that COVID is airborne. And so high air exchange rates on rail cars every six minutes, that air is exchanged um, and replenished with external air. So th- these are these are um, you know, positive ways that we're trying to address and, and build confidence because confidence is the key to bringing the riders back, knowing that uh, it's safe to come back. Um, and that's that's um, that's our goal. 
Lucy, I think Jim, Jim, that Miriam's question is is an excellent one. And on the Metro North side, there have been 125, I believe, MTA employees who've contracted COVID. Uh, I think we have to take our hats off to the bus drivers, uh, the, con- the train conductors, and the engineers who have been out there providing service since the beginning of the pandemic. And I think it is completely unfair to impose upon them uh, the enforcement of these mask rules. MTA has a $50 fine if you're not wearing a mask on a, on a Metro North train or a subway train. I think it's even higher in Connecticut. But it's not enforced. Uh, it's left to the MTA police, which is virtually non-existent in Connecticut. I think a bus or a train with a passenger who refuses to wear a mask should be stopped. That passenger should be ejected from the vehicle, period. Mm-hmm. Rich, how do you respond? Yeah, there's, there's. Uh, first, I want to uh, strongly support what uh, Jim is saying there. Uh, yeah, our, our drivers are on the front lines. They're doing a fantastic job. They're coming to work every day, and, and today is no exception with the snow. Um, as to ejecting customers, uh, we have witnessed um, some altercations nationally. We um, early on in the pandemic, uh, Philadelphia implemented a ejection rule and uh, customers were forcibly removed with handcuffs from from philadelphia area um, public transportation and it that that incident reverberated across the country among transit agencies it's um there is risk right i mean there's risk in covid but there's also risk in escalation with police force and um so you know it's i wish it were as as straightforward as as um, we'd like it to be, but um, it, it just simply is not. Mm. Um, We're going to continue talking with Rich Andreski, Bureau Chief for the Public Transportation at the Connecticut DOT, and Jim Cameron, a commuter advocate who writes a weekly commentary on transportation for Hearst and CTMirror.org. We want to talk about after the break, you know, where is the money going to come from to help rail and busways dealing with steep declines in ridership? And we'll take your questions too. the number 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're focused on the future of transportation in our state. My guest, Jim Cameron, commuter advocate and writer of a weekly commentary on transportation for Hearst and ctmirror.org. Also, Rich Andreski's here. He's the Public Transportation Bureau Chief for the State Department of Transportation. You can join us too, 888-720-9677. Uh, Jim, you brought up the point uh, that uh, revenue has uh, been declining, uh, ridership is down uh, drastically. What does this mean for the future of public transit? Let's start with the MTA. You've been following uh, what's happening down there uh, and what the future budget looks like when there's such a big hole uh, to fill. Well, yesterday, uh, the MTA, that's the uh, parent of Metro North, the Long Island Railroad, the bus and the city subways as well. The MTA passed a budget for next year with a $4.5 billion hole in it in expectation that there will be a federal uh, emergency bailout to that amount. And they promised that they would not do any of their, what they were referring to by by the summer as draconian cuts uh, until next year in in expectation of that federal funding. Um, If they don't get that money, and even if they do, I think you're going to see one of three different things. Uh, There's going to be cuts in service. Uh, There might be layoffs of employees. Uh, and there might be fare increases or any combination of two or three of those things. That's in the short run. Uh, Of greater concern to me is the MTA received a study from McKinsey, the consultants, which said that they think that after everybody's vaccinated and we get back to normal, um, it'll be about 80% of the old ridership. I think that is really overly optimistic. I think that Rich, in his experiences, we all had after 9-11, this is a much different episode. New York City is not going to die, but we're not going to have to get on a train and commute two hours a day round trip and pay 450 bucks a month for a commutation pass to be able to do our work. And I think that uh, businesses in New York City are closing offices, not just temporarily, but for good. 
Um, employees may go into the city once or twice a week if they needed to have a staff meeting. But, uh, you know, as you're doing today, you're doing this show remotely. We're participating remotely. Um, the kind of people that used to ride Metro North don't need to waste time and money. They could be more productive, have more time at home, be with their families. Uh, Post-pandemic, I don't think we're going to see ridership come back. And that's going to leave a huge hole in the budget. Mm. And that's where the question of the, what's the legislature <laughs> going to do? Rich, uh, briefly describe for us uh, DOT's relationship with the MTA. How will its financial problems impact us here? So for, uh, for uh, your listeners, uh, you know, MTA, New York, uh, and Metro North specifically runs all of the services on the New Canaan, Danbury Line, Waterbury Line, and New Haven Line. Their train crews, their personnel maintain the railroad and operate the services for the state. Um, any budget pressures that they're experiencing, um, we will we will suffer along with them on that. Um, keeping in mind that their their budget woes are are mirrored here in Connecticut. Fair revenue is down uh, statewide on transit, and um, so the funding has to come from somewhere. Uh, right now, we have a, a a bit of a stay of execution, so to speak, with the uh, federal federal aid that we received last year or the, late earlier this year but um, that will run out in 2021. Mm. So when we think about transit services on CT Transit, primarily funded through fares, uh, there have been fare hikes in the past. So uh, talk more about what you need, the DOT needs to hear from the legislature and the governor in terms of, of how to continue to fund these services. You know, our, you know, Governor Lamont has been an incredible advocate for, for rail in particular. Um, and before COVID was, was asking us to find ways to speed up the railroad. Um, we, unfortunately, with, with funding gaps in the past, we would turn to fare increases and could generate substantial revenue that way. Unfortunately, with ridership being down, fare increases are unlikely to get us there. And so then the alternative is what? Uh, the alternative is uh, more draconian service cuts that lead us into what we in the, in the industry refer to as the death spiral. The, the idea that the more you cut, the, the more people choose not to ride um, and then further putting additional budget pressure on, on the agency. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, th there's no clear answer here. What I would say to the legislature, um, if, if they ask me, is that um, our, our transportation infrastructure needs to be there um, beyond COVID and we can't turn it on and off like a, a light switch. Uh, we have a extensive workforce, uh, substantial capital assets that have to be maintained. So um, this is not um, easily, uh, you know, the, the costs are not easily adjusted. Jim, uh, the tolls never didn't go anywhere here in our state. But what about an increase in the gas tax? That's not something that people don't want to hear. But is that something that you think will be discussed seriously this session? Well, I think that uh, a gas tax increase is the easiest, the least of least unattractive of the alternatives to raise more money. Um, it doesn't require investment in infrastructure like a tolling system would. It is directly a user fee. If you're not a driver uh, and you take mass transit, you won't be seeing that tax increase. I think the fairest way of asking people to uh, you know, help cover these additional costs is to ask the people that are using them. And it may mean a small fare increase, although I agree with Rich, they're not even collecting peak fares now. They're still on off-peak fares to try to encourage people to ride. But I think a gasoline tax makes money, you know, uh, makes sense, and it will make money. Uh, the gasoline tax in Connecticut has not changed since 1997, when it was lowered 14 cents a gallon by our legislators in a very politically popular but long-term stupid move. Uh, they wanted to lower the gasoline tax, and that, that lowering in 1997 uh, has cost us billions of dollars that could have been helping maintain the roads and the rails. So I think even uh, you know Governor uh, Malloy's transportation finance panel recommended slowly raising the gasoline tax back up. Gas is cheap now. I've seen gas at a buck ninety nine around here. So who would notice a two or three cent tax on top of that? What worries me is that the no tolls CT people who were so successful 
in opposing tolls and scaring the you know what out of legislators just before the election are going to embrace that issue and say no no new taxes any anywhere anyhow and that's going to lead us into that uh, special transportation fund death spiral that rich was talking about Mm. Rich, we just have a couple of minutes left. A listener tweeted, how much profit do highways generate? Is that a threat to continued highway maintenance? You can't see me smiling, but with my <laughs> uh, tongue in my cheek. But uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right, Lucy. Um, uh, transportation of all sh- uh, forms um, is a subsidized proposition. Uh, even the airlines uh, at airports, right? The, air- the land side facilities are often funded by the public sector. So uh, transportation is an essential uh, service that the government provides. It's been that way for for generations. And uh, we need to figure out a solution here. Uh, There's, you know, a lot of a lot of good uh, thought leaders here in Connecticut that have some ideas. I think we just need to coalesce and move forward. And if if anything, COVID has shown us that we we really can't delay. We have to act and we have to find a way forward. Uh, meanwhile, you know, less cars on the roads better for many reasons, including safety and, of course, uh, a reduction in emissions from transportation. But, Rich, is there any discussion at, at the Department of Transportation about rethinking how to improve bike infrastructure in our state at this moment? Absolutely. We are very, very big fans of bicycle and what, what active trans- what is known as active transportation. And you'll see that through the investments over the last uh five to, to seven years, you'll see lots of trail investments in Connecticut. I'll also give a plug for our bike on board programs. Uh, you can right now bring your bike on board our uh, our Shoreline East and Hartford Line services. Uh, we're proud of that. We started that program about 18 months ago and uh, we need to do more. I think uh, folks are looking for healthy lifestyles, uh, ability to get out. And, and um, so I, I do think uh, the department will be continuing to prioritize uh, bicycle and pedestrian improvements going forward. Mm. Last word for you, uh, Jim Cameron, as we look forward, uh, you know, Pete Buttigieg is being room or is, you know, been chosen for secretary of transportation. A lot of focus on what the feds can give states like Connecticut. What do you want to see in the next few months? Uh, I want to see the Congress and I want to see the legislature in this state of Connecticut get serious about what they've paid lip service to for decades now. Uh, We keep hearing about infrastructure and nobody does anything. Well, come on, legislature, you've been uh, doing nothing for the past nine months, one short session in the summer. Get back to work, start dealing with the realities of what's going to be involved with saving transportation in this state. Um, same thing with uh, the, the Congress. I think they've got to get serious about investing in our future. You know, poor Rich with his staff is trying to hold together with Band-Aids and gaffing tape um, the, the infrastructure of our roads and rails without investing anything new in new equipment or, or advanced services. So uh, we have to realize mass transit is crucial to this state and our nation's economy, and we've got to invest in it. You can read more of Jim Cameron's thoughts again in Hearst and on ctmirror.org. He's a commuter advocate. Jim, thanks so much for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks, Lucy. Also, Rich Andreski, Bureau Chief for Public Transportation at the Connecticut Department of Transportation, the DOT. Rich, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we talk more about bike infrastructure. Uh, again, this is Connecticut Public Radio's end-of-the-year fundraising campaign. This week, each day, Where We Live talks to Connecticut residents about issues that affect our state, and you can join in on those conversations. Please support Where We Live and Connecticut Public Radio with a pledge. Here are two of my colleagues to tell you more. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Tess Terrible. I'm the senior producer on the show, and we're interrupting the show just for a brief bit to encourage you to support your local public radio station by calling 1-800-584-2788. That's 1-800-584-2788. This week is our local pledge drive here at Connecticut Public. And if you enjoy this programming, if you want to support this type of programming, you're hearing right now, again, number is one 800 
584-2788. You might be hearing a little bit of noise in the background today because I'm producing at home. We've been producing at home for the last uh, eight or so months here at Connecticut Public Radio. And but that hasn't slowed us down at all from bringing you the best content we can, the best coverage we can. And I'm here today with Christina. She's with membership here at Connecticut Public. Christina, how's it going? It's not too bad, Tess. As you mentioned, we're, we're all working remotely these days and it's been a little different, but the work that we've been doing here and just the heavy lift for my colleagues having to do interviews and producing radio shows and all the different projects that they have coming down the pike as if just the work for those enough wasn't enough, wasn't enough. But now trying to do that remotely just within the world that we're in right now is just slightly added challenge. But we are here. We are doing it. Let me give you that number again. It's 1-800-584-2788. As Tess mentioned, this drive is five days, five short days. And we need to raise a lot of money in five days. And what we need is for you to go to the phone or you to go online to wnpr.org, hit the red donate button, and we need you to donate as strongly as you can right now. That number again, 1-800-584-2788. Again, that's 1-800-584-2788. It hasn't been too bad um, working from home for me this week, Christina, because I just put up my Christmas tree, and that makes me really happy. I get to see that as I produce this show every day with Lucy Nalpathanchel and our other producer, Carmen Baskoff. Um, But it's really amazing that we haven't had to slow down the coverage we've brought on the listeners. I'm incredibly proud to be part of this team you know we're you're hearing us most days through zoom in our home offices it's really bringing our work home and I mean I think I speak for my team when I say you know this work is personal it means a lot to us we put our heart and soul into it and it really means a lot getting the support of our listeners like yourself that are listening right now Um, that number is 1-800- 584-2788. You can always go online to wnpr.org. And thank you so much for listening. We we really do appreciate it. Um, part of our show is, as you know, if you're listening now, we are a call-in show. We love hearing from our listeners. We love hearing your feedback, your support, your comments, whatever that is. And um, we wouldn't be able to keep doing this program without your support. 1-800-584-2788. And you can also go online to WNPR. One of the really great ways that we can thank our donors and, you know, our listeners, Tess, is when they donate, and especially when you go online to WNPR.org, you're going to see some of the great ways that we can thank you. I know a really popular one this year is that Connecticut Public Beanie. It's a really nice waffle hat. It's warm, is what I've heard. (laughs) They don't stay on my head, but I have way too much hair for that. But if your head gets cold all the time and you want to show folks what you love and what you love to support, that Connecticut Public Beanie is great. You can become a monthly donor at $10 a month, or if you prefer to do it all once, get it out of the way. It's a $120 donation, and then we'll send along that waffle beanie to keep your head warm, and it'll have that little blue P logo stitched right into it. It is a really snazzy hat. But the most important thing is to make sure that you support what you love. Again, it's a five-day drive. As you know, we always have to raise a large amount of money. And every hour of a pledge drive counts. And every donation counts. Whether it's $120, whether it's $1,000, whether it's $5 a month. At the end of the drive, every single dollar and every single penny counts. So call right now. 1-800-584-2788. And thanks. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. There might be a silver lining to the pandemic if you're a bicyclist. Will cities use this moment to shift away from our car-centric habits and focus on bike infrastructure? Joining me now on Zoom is Karen Jenkins, member of the Board of Directors of the New Haven Coalition for Active Transportation. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Lucy. I'm delighted to be here. The last several months have been pretty terrible for a lot of people. But when we think about bicycling, 
has this been an opportunity for more people uh, to choose uh, to to bicycle than than they have before and to reconnect or to to meet new people in their communities? Yes, across the country and particularly in Connecticut and New Haven where I live, people have dusted off their old bicycles, looked for used bicycles, gone to the bicycle shops which were declared essential businesses to get on their bikes. They wanted to avoid getting on public transportation or were unsure of public transportation, and it's been wonderful to see. Unfortunately, across the country, and again in Connecticut, our municipalities and city areas, even rural areas, have not taken advantage of this opportunity by closing streets to traffic and opening them to people on bikes and, of course, pedestrians. So when I've used the phrase uh, biking infrastructure a couple times earlier in the show, that's what we're talking about here, uh, finding ways to to slow our streets down, maybe having protected bike lanes or boulevards. Uh, we saw some of that during the pandemic to help uh, restaurants with outdoor dining. But, uh, you know, now that um, a lot of people can't eat outdoors, there's the changes to the, the traffic flow, Karen. Well, I think municipalities have to take into consideration the importance of the bicycle as a serious means of transportation. I also like to point out that the largest public area are the streets, Mm. bigger than our parks, but our streets are almost solely devoted to moving automobiles and a few people in them, rather than looking at the streets as available to all the public, pedestrians and cyclists. And if we want to get more people biking and walking, we need to build an infrastructure so that they feel safe and that they're confident when riding the streets. And that means, as you mentioned, Lucy, protected bike lanes, which means you're separating the traffic, road motorized traffic from bicyclists and pedestrians. It also means that we're making it easier and more comfortable for women and seniors to get on bikes. Those are two risk averse populations. And studies have shown in Europe that when women and seniors are on bikes, it means you've built up the infrastructure and given them the encouragement to go out on their bicycles. At the New Haven Coalition for Active Transportation, we also promote bike education in schools. We believe that every child K through 12 should have bike education classes as well as opportunities to ride. And while we don't diminish the importance of other sports, Riding a bicycle means that there's always a place to go. You don't need a special pitch or field or equipment. You need a bicycle, a helmet, and you can ride anywhere. So we're big believers in bike education in the schools. And then we think that leads to better infrastructure, such as we're doing in New Haven. Mm. So tell me more about uh, your city, New Haven, in terms of how, depending on what part of the city you're in, that biking infrastructure exists, where in others, it's it's harder to feel comfortable on a bicycle on the street. Well, I want to be careful what I say, because we have very good relations with City Hall and with our Department of Traffic, Transportation, Parking, the director is Doug house Layden, who's worked very hard to build the infrastructure. But there's no doubt that less well-served neighborhoods are less well-served when it comes to bike infrastructure. Mm. That's a fact. And so we need to be very mindful of the inequities in biking and walking. And again, the pandemic has opened up conversations, important conversations about inequity and how do we make sure that everyone has access to streets that are safe. It's especially important, this came up during the earlier part of the conversation, as we look at people in the service sector, essential workers, low wage workers, immigrants, many of whom use bicycles to get to work, or maybe they're using a combination of a bicycle and a bus and then a train. So the fact that parts of New Haven have better bike infrastructure than other parts means that we're not doing a very good job. We need to do a better job of pushing that infrastructure out into areas that currently are not as well served as others. 
Mm. You're hearing on Zoom today here on Where We Live, Karen Jenkins, member of the Board of Directors of the New Haven Coalition for Active Transportation. If you're someone who has relied more on your bicycle, especially in these last several months, that we want to hear from you, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. There was this uh, bicycle boom, so to speak, uh, Karen, uh, earlier in the pandemic. It was kind of hard for some people to find bicycles uh, that they wanted to purchase. But tell us more about the bicycle education education that you mentioned. Uh, and uh, as you offered these uh, classes uh, to people in New Haven, what was the response and who were the people taking the courses? Well, thank you so much for asking. The New Haven Coalition for Active Transportation is about two years old. We are a nonprofit organization. We promote all forms of active transportation, walking, biking, and of course, use of public transportation. But we decided to focus on bike education because we felt it was important to get more people on their bikes and to be on the roads riding safely, knowledgeably, and comfortably. We offer classes at no charge. We do not charge for our classes. We do not ask anyone how much money they have, what their income is. We just ask them what their riding level is so we can pitch the class or gear the class to them. We have found this year, this summer, thank you to the Parks Department and again, the Department of Traffic, Transportation and Parking. We had several venues at Parks, uh, Edgewood Park in particular was the main location we used, Ranger Station. Every class was full. We had a minimum, sorry, maximum of eight due to COVID-19 social distancing requirements. Not only was every class full, we generated waiting lists for every class and our classes were diverse in the participants. Because we do not charge, we do not ask people to pay. Of course, at some point we ask for a donation and we do run fundraising campaigns. But we just think it's important because, Lucy, if you're on a bike and I'm on a bike, it doesn't matter what our age is, what our income is, our gender. We are equally vulnerable on a bike on roads where motorists are not paying attention or there may not be a good bike infrastructure. And because we're equally vulnerable, we want everyone to have access to bike education classes. Mm. We use the smart cycling curriculum of the League of American Bicyclists, which is a national organization founded in 1880. We are the old, that is the oldest bike education, sorry, the bike ad, oldest bike advocacy organization in the world. And I had the very great pleasure to chair that board of directors for five years. Um, and then the league also trains and certifies bicycle instructors. It's the only nationally recognized bike certification program for instructors. And I'm very proud to say I am a league cycling instructor. Mm. You raised an important point, uh, Karen, where there's such so much emphasis on teaching people how to drive, but not on bike safety or how to drive around bikes. That could be a change as well that, that we could see in our state. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yes, because people who drive when they get a drive, if you walk into the motor vehicle department, wherever your local one, for instance, there are no signs that say get on your bike. Um, as an example, get out of your car, get on your bike. <laughs> yeah. There's very little in the bike and the driver education program on the test to make it motorists aware of cyclists and pedestrians. We never want to forget pedestrians. So yes, informing our motoring public how important it is to be mindful of cyclists. And also because um, cyclists and pedestrians lately have taken really serious, there are just serious statistics about them. Whereas um, in terms of fatalities, 165 mm -hmm. pedestrians and 92 cyclists were struck by motorcycle motor vehicles in New Haven in 2018, 165 pedestrians, 92 cyclists were hit with recently three deaths occurred, fatalities. We also know in Connecticut that 3% of federal funding is spent on safety programs to reduce the dangers faced by pedestrians and cyclists, but we comprise 18% of traffic fatalities in Connecticut. So we need to rethink how we are training everyone so that the streets are safe, whether you're driving a car, walking, or on a bicycle. One of you the know, reasons I'm, we... Karen, well, I'm talking uh, to you uh, again remotely on a day where it's uh, there's a lot of snow around our state, and we're hearing from people who, you know, they choose to, to bike, and there's plows putting snow into bike lanes. That's also an issue, uh, considering yes. that people use these lanes to get around for work and else. Well... They use the lanes and not only, I mean, today, obviously an exception when it snows, but it's not an exception where people are 
parking in bike lanes. Mm. So those of us who use the bike lanes, that is an all too frequent occurrence that the public, the driving public does not respect the bike lanes. And so uh, moving forward, Karen, again, uh, there's a lot of, of improvement uh, needed in our state. What would you like to see? If there's one thing from our state legislature in this session, there's so many things uh, on their agenda. But when we think about bike infrastructure and how to make our roads safe for cyclists and pedestrians, what would you like to see? I'm going to give a slightly off-center answer and say that I think we should close the streets on Sundays. Mm. I one time was on a panel. So let's close I-91 for a Sunday, just close it and open I-91 to cyclists and pedestrians, a little radical. I think if we could close our streets to motorized traffic and open them to people walking and biking, we would encourage people to see their neighborhoods differently, to move around or into neighborhoods they might not otherwise have gone to, and also to become healthier. One of the great benefits of biking is that people are healthier when they bike, those of us who bike know you're happier when you bike. And just as importantly, biking and walking contribute to a cleaner environment. Mm. So the easy thing is always to say we need more money. Yep. I don't like to say that we close our streets to traffic on a regular basis and open them up to people. Well, we'll have to leave it there, Karen Jenkins. I think those are some good ideas uh, to, to end the show. Again, she's a member of the Board of Directors of the New Haven Coalition for Active Transportation. Uh, today's show, produced by Carmen Baskoff. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Again, it's the end of the year fundraising campaign for Connecticut Public. Support where we live and all the conversations you hear daily. Here are two of my colleagues with more. Thank you so much for listening to Connecticut Public Radio. Uh, you are listening to Where We Live with Lucy Nalpathanchel. And as you've been hearing, because I know you have been listening faithfully, we are in the middle of a fun drive, and we just need to take a few minutes to come and ask for your support. Uh, if you've been listening for a while, then you know what our, what our model is. You know, we don't have to rely on those really large companies that a lot of other radio stations might need to. We are beholden to you, our listeners. And because that's our model, we have to come to you a handful of times a year and ask for your support. And you can do that by calling 1-800-584-2788. If you prefer to donate online, listen, we got you covered. Go to WNPR.org, click on that red donate button, donate as strongly as you can. I know one of the popular things this time of year are the Connecticut Public Radio socks. They are very snazzy, red and white. They have a um, sound wave on it. And I believe we have very limited quantity of quantity of them. So if that's something that tickles your fancy, please make a donation right now to secure those. You can do that for an $8 a month donation and you can finish the rest of this drive knowing that you've done your part to support. That number again, 1-800-584-2788. That number again is 1-800-584-2788. I'm Tess. I'm one of the producers here on Where We Live. Christina, you just told our listeners about the socks. And before this, our first break, uh, the, the hat that they can yes. get by going online to WMPR.org. I'm pretty excited about both of these items. I decided this winter I'm going to learn to ski, so I might need to... Ooh. To invest in some good winter gear for that hat and warm socks sounds uh -huh. good. Um, and that's just one of the many like pandemic activities I've picked up. And I hope making um, WMPR and public radio is also one of maybe your pandemic activities, making us part of your routine every day. Um, and if that is so, and if you value this type of programming that you hear from pub public radio, you can't get it anywhere else. The number is 1-800-584-2788. You can always go online to WMPR.org if that's easier for you to donate that way. We really appreciate all your support. Every dollar counts here at Connecticut Public. We are a listener-supported station. We would not exist. We could not keep doing this work without your support. Um, I know my team at Where We Live values it immensely to still be bringing you this program, even amongst coronavirus times. So thanks for listening and thanks for donating.